Hello everyone and welcome back to our channel. In this video we are going to cover the basic concepts of connected and autonomous vehicles. This will come in handy for our future video looking at V2X or vehicle to everything. Let's start with the absolute basics. Most of us have phones that connect to the internet via mobile networks when we are outside. We can create hotspots on our phones and other mobiles and devices can connect to the first device using Wi-Fi. One can be riding in a car along with others and create a hotspot for everyone else. This generally works fine, but what often happens is that signals from the towers are attenuated before penetrating the car. One can get decent speeds, but if there was a way we could have antennas outside or on the roof, it would make so much more sense. This is where the connected car comes into the picture. Rather than using one of the phones to create a Wi-Fi hotspot in the car, the car contains the modem and a Wi-Fi hotspot is created by the car. What exactly is a modem? It stands for modulator, demodulator, and in simple terms, this is the module that communicates with the mobile network. We can have cellular modems in all devices, including phones and smartphones that need to communicate with a cellular network. So in very simple terms, a connected car has its own mobile cellular modem that can connect to the mobile network and create a wireless local area network, which allows the car to share internet access and data with other devices inside and in some cases outside the car. Now think of all the things we could do with a connected car. Most popular would be infotainment, which includes browsing, listening to songs, podcasts, or watching videos over YouTube or Netflix. Video calls for conferencing, especially when working, etc. The main requirement here would be high bandwidth. Then there is the traffic efficiency, which includes live traffic information, navigation, and toll collection. We need an extremely reliable connection for this. Finally, think about traffic safety, which includes hazard warning, collision warning, and cooperative autonomous cruise control. Along with high reliability, we are also looking at low latency and communications here. And there is a lot more one can do like diagnostics and telematics. Telematics is monitoring of various car metrics by leveraging GPS, communication networks and sensors. They are mainly used by insurance companies, but can be used by car manufacturers as well. One can get all kinds of information, including location, speed, idling time, harsh acceleration or braking, fuel consumption, vehicle faults and more. When analysed for particular events and patterns, this information can provide in-depth insights across an entire fleet. At the same time, the car manufacturer can run diagnostics and send an alert if there is a recall or it needs to get something fixed before it breaks down. A software update can be done as well when the car is idle or switched off. This is one example of commercial models in a connected car. One would need to include some kind of connectivity module or a modem or a head unit as shown. This would come with some data included. As shown in the picture, it is free for a year. After that, some kind of subscription fee would be required. This is of course from an old presentation by SEAT. It may have changed significantly from country to country. In case you were wondering, the connected cars would have SIM cards in them. Rather than a physical SIM, it is generally an embedded SIM or an eSIM today. And in the future, it would be an integrated SIM or iSIM. We have talked about these SIM cards in another video. AT&T are one of the leaders in providing connected cars. Back in October 2018, they reported nearly 24 million connected cars on their network. Their data plan offered with these connected cars is shown here. Either pay $10 a month when you add it to one of your existing plans, or pay $20 a month for unlimited data. You can read more about their OnStar program by clicking the link in the slides. All our slides are available on our SlideShare channel. We have explained in various videos how 5G needs different spectrum layers. One thing that is heavily discussed is the use of millimeter waves for connected cars. The problem is they do not penetrate through glass panes. 
Well, one approach is to have antennas in the roof or the car body. NTT Docomo in Japan is looking at how to make transparent antennas that can be present in the windshield. This is a summary of these transparent antennas from NTT Docomo and AGC. References are provided at the end. As you can see, NTT Docomo is targeting the 28 GHz band, which is used for high throughput layer in Japan. This band will be different in different countries, so it may be a bit challenging right now. While we have been talking about 4G and 5G cellular connectivity, some vehicle manufacturers are also exploring how to supplement cellular connectivity with satellite-based connectivity. This can come in really handy in rural and remote areas. The biggest challenge is to have flat satellite antennas that can be hidden in the car roof. An example is shown here that has been demonstrated and works, but it still may be some time before this becomes popular. Autonomous or self-driving vehicles use information from cameras, LiDAR and radar to create a 3D digital map of their surroundings. While today they mostly operate by themselves, in the future they will communicate with other vehicles around them to gain more information of the surroundings and decide on their speed, acceleration, braking, when it is safe to turn and drive safely by anticipating the movements of others. While autonomous vehicles should operate smoothly and safely, even when they have no connectivity to the network, it will definitely help if connectivity is available. Within built-up areas, the autonomous vehicles can get information from infrastructure, such as traffic lights, road signs, lane markings, and roadwork sites to give you a heads up about a traffic jam, road closures, accidents, or even a sharp bend in the road before you can see it. In our earlier video on the Tesla Model 3, we looked at the autopilot feature. We discussed that the basic autopilot feature comes as standard. However, an enhanced autopilot feature can also be purchased. In the future, Tesla expects that full self-driving capability will be available in the cars for those who are willing to pay extra for the feature. We also discussed that the car contains many different types of sensors and cameras to ensure that the autopilot feature works regardless of any connectivity from the mobile network. When we talk about automation for self-driving cars, there are six levels to be considered from zero to five, as can be seen in the diagram. Before we go further, let's define what is meant by longitudinal and lateral driving task. The longitudinal driving task includes regulating the vehicle's cruise velocity, while the lateral driving task includes steering the vehicle's wheels for path tracking. So starting with the levels, level zero is the basic level with absolutely no automation. This is the status quo today. In level one, the vehicle features a single automated system for driver assistance, such as steering or accelerating cruise control, adaptive cruise control where the vehicle can be kept at a safe distance behind the next car qualifies as level one because the human driver monitors the other aspects of driving, such as steering and braking. In level two, there is partial automation where the vehicle can control both steering and acceleration or deceleration. Here the automation falls short of self-driving because a human is sitting in the driver's seat and is responsible for the car control at any time. Tesla Autopilot is an example of level 2 automation. Level 3, conditional driving automation, is a substantial jump from a technological perspective, but subtle if not negligible from a human perspective. Level 3 vehicles have environmental detection capabilities and can make informed decisions for themselves, such as accelerating past a slow moving vehicle, but they still require human override. The driver must remain alert and ready to take control if the system is unable to execute the task. Level four is referred to as high driving automation. The main difference between level three and level four automation is that level four vehicles can intervene if things go wrong or there is a system failure. In this sense, these cars do not require human interaction in most circumstances. However, a human still has the option to manually override. Level 4 vehicles can operate in self-driving mode, but until legislation and infrastructure evolves, 
they can only do so within a limited area, usually an urban environment where top speeds reach an average of 30 miles per hour. This is known as geofencing. As such, most level four vehicles in existence are geared towards ride sharing. Finally, we have level five or full driving automation. Level five vehicles do not require human attention. Level five cars in the future may not even have steering wheels or acceleration and braking pedals. They will be free from geofencing, able to go anywhere and do anything that an experienced human driver can do. The general consensus is that we will not see cars with level five automation before 2030. This is another way of showing the automation levels, but it highlights the transition of responsibility from humans to machines. We can say that in level three, both humans and machines are equally responsible, while machines have higher responsibility from level four onwards and humans have higher responsibility below level three. We will be making a new video about V2X soon, so watch this space. Here are some references for further reading on this topic. We hope you enjoyed learning about connected and autonomous vehicles as much as we enjoyed making this video. As always, please feel free to leave questions, feedback, suggestions in the comment section below. Thank you and hope to see you again soon.